It's good to be here today. It's different. It's different today. I haven't had to run media and be up here in one day in a minute. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord today, and I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you from Acts chapter 1. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In the King James, it says, but ye shall receive power. And I just want to talk to you for a little bit on this. You shall receive power. I've been thinking on this since Brother Price has gotten here, well, came here, and we had that move. And this thought hasn't left my mind for the past couple weeks. The power that's about to happen in the church. It's unimaginable. But I I can't wait to see what's going to happen. It's been powerful. Every week I come in here, I still feel that power. And so I, I was thinking of stories where God just shows just unimaginable power and first story that came to mind was Moses and I didn't add the veggie tail version because there's a better version than the veggie tail it's hard to believe but veggie tails is not always the best version of something just go with me on this it'll be worth it but we start in Exodus chapter 3 And it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, in in the priest of Midian. And he led the flock back to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was was not consumed. I don't know about you, but in my time that I've walked in the desert, if a bush is on fire, that's not out of the ordinary. But the bush is, uh, well, it's still green. And it doesn't seem like it's wilting from a heat. For me, I'm going to be freaking out because that's not nature. And I like fire as much as the next person. Right, Megan? There's a story behind that one. But if a bush is burning, it should be wilting. So you just come up to a random bush in the desert and, well, it's it's still alive. The next part would really freak you out. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why does the bush not burn? So when the Lord saw they turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. God starts talking to him from the burning bush. If that were me, I should, I should have made a slide for this. I would have been deuces, just gone. I ain't staying there. This bush is talking to me, gone. Goodbye, adios, avita sin, ciao, ding dong day. <laughs> but you, yeah, no, you, you don't have a bush just talk to you when you're in the middle of a desert, especially one on fire. But God starts talking to him. He says, they said, do not draw near to this place. 
Take off your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I'm just going to inject the joke of this place must be holy ground because mom never has her shoes on. So maybe we should follow in mom's footsteps. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Again, this is taking it off of pla taking place in the desert, and especially it's taking place in the desert in the Middle East next to the equator. So we're going to nerd out here. It's hot. And I am assuming this is the middle of the day. And what does sand do when it gets hot? Would you want to be walking on that barefooted? It would hurt. And so God's just like, yeah, take your sandals off. Oh God, it's the middle of the day. There's not a cloud in the sky. You sure that's a good idea? <laughs> yeah, you wonder what goes through their heads w when God is saying this stuff. But Moses, being obedient to the Lord, he takes his shoes off. There's power in obedience to the Lord. Even if it doesn't make sense to us, there's power in that obedience. And Samuel says, so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed the fat of the ram. So God is basically... From Samuel, it is better to obey. So God's just like, we're going to get you right. As Dad was talking about repentance, we're just going to get you right good. Take your sandals off. Okay, now you've obeyed me. Now we're, now we're good to talk. And I want to talk to you about what's happening. It's been a while since you and I have had a conversation. Because... Moses has been away from Egypt. He ran away, and now, now he's, he's living a great life. He has a wife, family. He's living his life, and now all of a sudden God's coming in, and he's like, how you doing? It's been a while. Remember me? So the, he basically gets Moses' back Back to repentance, back to square one. And the Lord says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cries of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. There's a lot of ites. Um, but he lists what's been going on in Egypt since he's left. He's like, it hasn't gotten better. In fact, it's gotten worse since the last time you were there. And so, Moses has been away about 40 years at this point. That's not a small time to be away from because his family's there. He knows his family's there because that's one of the reasons he ran is because he was protecting his people and so he ran, and now it's been 40 years. A lot happens in 40 years. That's half my life. 
just give you a moment of dad is old. Um, you can't see me. But 40 years, and God's telling him, what, what's, what's the latest update? Wish it was cheerier. <laughs> but he, he knows where you're at, regardless. God knows where you're at. It doesn't matter if you're away from him a month, a week, a day, a couple minutes, years. God, God knows where you're at every second of every day from before you were born to the end. He knows exactly where you're going to be at every single moment because he exceeds time. And in Hebrews it says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that you have, for he himself, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can't run away from your calling. If you're called to something, it will always eat at you, for lack of a bit. But God will always be like, Remember what I told you? What, remember what I asked you to do? But I don't want to do it, God. I don't, want to, I don't want that burden on me. And he just keeps poking it. Remember what I told you this moment? Remember that time I gave you? It doesn't go away. It just pokes at you. And Moses knew he was going to go back eventually. I think he knew eventually he had to go back. But in Romans it says, For the gift of, and the callings of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these, are, these also have been been disobedient that they may that though the mercy shown you they also may obtain mercy there are no take backs with God you can't give up on God it, it is a thing that lives on in your life forever once you allow God into your life he's there no matter if you want to ignore the fact that he's there or not, he is there. But with that comes great power because God is in your life. And we've been talking about it in Sunday schools in weeks past, how as soon as God's entered the moment, the impossible starts. We can think about everything we want, but the impossible has just begun once God's in the moment. And so, God, so God had a purpose for calling you. God has a purpose for why you're here. But Moses, for, for Moses, he, uh, he suffers the same thing that we all suffer with, and that's doubt. God, Dad was talking about it. As soon as you could have a, a great moment with God, but as soon as she hit the back doors, was that really him? And doubt will hit you right then. But that's your time you run back to the altar. And in Exodus chapter 3, Moses still standing next to a burning bush because, again, not natural. Uh, he says... But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. I shall, get, I shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people of Egypt, you shall serve the God on this mountain. He asks a very valid question at this time. Who am I 
to represent you. And God gives the same speech over and over again to people that ask that question. He gave the same response to Gideon. He gave the same response to Moses. He gave the same response to uh, Jacob. It's not you. But through you, they're going to see me. I will be with you, and they will know that I am with you. We always feel like we aren't good enough. And Lord knows we aren't good enough. But there's a man that died on the cross that in Acts 2.38 it says we are good enough through him that has given his life for our sins so that we don't have to ever beg for mercy. Dad put it last week, we do not beg for repentance. God gives us repentance every day, seven times 70. That repentance renewed every single day. And so we're never going to be good enough. But God, God's like, it doesn't matter who you are, Moses, because I'm going to be in it. I'm going to interject myself into it. Well, I, I can't speak right. How, 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 how am I going to do this? I'm going to give you somebody that will speak for you. You're just going to be there as my body. Getting ahead of myself, but. In John, First John four four, he says, "You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world." When God gets in your life, it becomes greater. It's something that can't change. Doesn't matter how long you've had a relationship. <laughs> Dad has used it. I've used it. Doesn't matter where you are in a walk. Just matters we're pointing in the same direction. And he's trying to get that through Moses. You know, doesn't matter. Just trust in me. Trust that I'm going to do everything right. You, you're not going to be in charge of this. But just listen to what I have to say. And so in Exodus chapter 4, it says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. He said, cast it onto the ground. So he cast it onto the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. How many of you would like it if you would throw a stick on the ground, and it turned into a snake? It'd be kind of cool, right, Dan? And then the rest of you hate snakes and you need help because they're awesome. <laughs> and so the Lord really, really wants to catch him up to a, this is what I'm able to do. You see that stick you're holding? Yeah, it's all right. Throw it on the ground. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but... Uh, a snake and a tree have very little in common. Just saying. They, they're not alike at all. And so he's, he's getting caught up in, oh God, what if, what if they say it's not you? What if they, he's getting caught up in reality because reality states, 
well, I've ran away for 40 years. <laughs> I haven't been exactly the best person to you guys. <laughs> you know, I lived in the palace and let this happen to you, and then kind of ran away when stuff didn't go my way. So, so what is it to say that I'm okay to, uh, to come help you guys, to just kind of say, hey, I'm here to set you free. Well, why didn't you do it when you were in the palace, when you had some authority? Now you're, you're coming back 40 years later, new pharaoh, mind you. It's a new pharaoh. And now you're going to say, hey, I'm here, and we're going to walk out of here. What would be your thought in that? <laughs> People who th saw you run away and have not seen you since. It's a valid point. <laughs> Will they receive me once I tell them who sent me? And so God has to make a fine point. Listen, this is how you know I'm with you. And so, like I was saying, God, Mo Moses was very scared to speak. And so God says, in Exodus 4 and 16, he's talking about Aaron. He said, so he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself Oh, shall be your mouth for you and you shall be to him as God because sometimes you may not have the ability to speak but if God has given you a way of using your talents to give your gifts we have said it before speaking behind the pulpit is no different than cleaning the toilets at the church it's all a ministry in itself. And so God is telling Moses, hey, you may not be able to speak. I'll give you someone to speak, but you are going to perform stuff in front of people. Well, I'm shy and bashful. With God, that all is going to go away. Trust in me and know that I am with you. And so then Moses goes back to Egypt. And this is the first encounter that Moses has with the new Pharaoh of Egypt. And it goes in Exodus chapter 7. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, and they did so just as the Lord commanded them. And Aaron cast down the rod before the Pharaoh, and before his servants it became a ser serpent. Pretty cool trick, right? Does it twice now. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Remember I said there's something better than veggie tales, and I may have threw this in for mom because now it's going to get stuck in all y'all's heads. power of God. <laughs> oh, uh, impressive. Hmm. Very well, Moses. I'll play along. <laughs> Hotep, hoy! Give this snake charmer 
our answer. Sawbeck, Sakmet, Soka, Salka, Reshpu, Wajak, Anubis, Anukis, Seshmu, Meshat, Hemsut, Tafnut, Hekt, Mafdet, Ra, Nut, Nut, Pata, Hemsut, Tafnut, Soka, Sakat, Seshmu, Reshpu, Sawbeck, Wajak, Hekt, Mafdet, Nefti, Nakmet, Ra! So you think you've got friends in high places? with the power to put us on the run. Well, forgive us these smiles on our faces. You'll know what power is when we are done, son. You're playing with the big boys now. Playing with the big boys now. Oh, that's pretty. Every spell and gesture tells you who's the best. You're playing with the big boys now. You're playing with the big boys now. You're playing with the big boys now. Stop this foolish mission. What's a true magician? Give an exhibition how. Pick up your silly twig, boy. You're playing with the big boys now. That's going to be stuck in all y'all's heads for the rest of the day. You're welcome. But, but as the video showed, the magicians come out and they're like, it's a cool party trick. We can do that too. And so they don't take anything Moses says seriously. And so Moses and Aaron leave. And the next day comes. Also in chapter 7 of Exodus, and it says, Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know I'm the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the rivers with the rod of in, that is in my hand. And they shall return to blood, and the fish that are in the river shall die and shall stink. And the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. The Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take the rod and stretch out your hand before the waters of Egypt, over the streams, over the, their rivers, over their ponds, and over their pools, that they may become blood, and there shall be be blood throughout the lands of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. This is a big deal because one of the biggest things 
for a civilization to live is water. And so God's like, okay, the snake didn't work. I'm going to take away all your drinking water. How about that? (laughs) Is that going to do the trick? Well, here comes the magicians again. So it says, Then the magicians of Egypt did their enchantments, and the Pharaoh's heart grew hard. And they did not heed them as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned down and went into his house, Neither was his heart moved by this. The snake they made a replica of, and then they did the water into blood. That's two miracles that the magicians have replicated. And God's like, okay, we can, we can, we can turn up the heat a little bit more. Then, if if this isn't getting the point, let's let's go a little bit further. And so, in Exodus chapter eight, the second plague. And the Lord spoke to Moses, "Go to Pharaoh, say to him." Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the rivers shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedrooms, on your bed, into the house of your servants, on your people, into your oven, and into kneading bowls. (laughs) <laughs> and the frog shall come up on you, on your people, and all your servants. The Nile is life for the people of Egypt. And so, turning it to blood didn't work. All right. Well, we're going to make all the frogs, which if you're in the south or in France, this is a dream come true. Because you get all the frog legs you want. <laughs> Come on, let's get some Cajun fry. (laughs) They're already in the oven, baby. (laughs) Just turn the heat up to 450 and let's get them cooking. But if you poison the Nile, you kill Egypt. So blood is the first dose, and now we're overran with frogs. But again, here comes the magician. And uh well they they pull out something. I don't know what they pulled out, but it says in Exodus 8, 7, and 8, they said, And the magicians did their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. This is the second time. This is the third time they've replicated it, a miracle. But you can you cannot replicate it, but there's something to remember. In Romans three and four it says, Certainly not indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. That you may justify your words and may overcome when you are judged. God is true, but every man is a liar. It does not matter what the world thinks they can replicate. The Olympics this year replicated the Last Supper painting.
but they may replicate the painting, but they're not going to replicate replicate the experience that there is in a church. They can mock the church as much as they want, but when they come into a church, there's something here that they can't replicate out there. There's power here. There's power in the house of God, especially when we use the word of God in every service and every word that we use. Because with the word, there's life. And we use the word to justify what we do because there's power in the word of God. And so they can replicate all they want because man is going to lie. It is nature of the beast. Every man's a liar, but God is the one that stays true through all his promises. He is the one that when he makes a promise, he will follow through with it. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. If God made you a promise, he will follow through on it. It may take some time. It's not in my timing, but I know God has his own timing for when it will be happening. And so magicians are replicating all of what Moses is doing. And Pharaoh is just like, see, you're not special. What does this God have that my gods don't have? And finally, God's like, okay, you've done the serpent, you've done the blood, you've done frogs. We'll see how far your power goes. My power is past anything you can ever think. And so the next thing the Lord does, so the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out, your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lice throughout all the lands of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth. And it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice but they could not. So there, is, there were lice on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is not the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. The magician said, this is not our gods. And the rest, if you look at all this has been said before, but if you look at all the plagues of Egypt, remember in the song they're listing off their gods? Each plague attacks one of their gods. And the ninth and final plague attacks their king. It attacks Ra. It brings darkness to the land because the sun, that's supposed to be Ra moving through the land. And God says, I will take out one by one what you hold as your God. And I will show you what my might is compared to you. You may have done three, but I got ten. You can't replicate everything I do. And so you're either going to heed my warning, Pharaoh, because the Old Testament God, as we have mentioned before the old testament could be rated r all the stuff that goes on and old testament god did not mess around and he basically gives pharaoh nine shots at saying either listen to my man of god that i have put in front of you i'm trying to protect you i'm trying to protect your people you just have to listen to me and Pharaoh is just like, I don't want to do it. Look at the work that they're doing. I lose that if I let them go. Well, fine. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And Moses comes to him before the last one. And he heeds the warning. 
And Pharaoh doesn't want to listen to it. God's power was so great against the Egyptians. And they confessed that this is not their God, that it's his God. You would think at that point they would come to their senses and say, maybe we should listen to this guy. He's doing stuff that we haven't even seen before. In Exodus 33, it says, And he said, Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will be compassion on whom I will have compassion. He sees the glory of the Lord and the strength to go forward. But this is all Old Testament. This is God showing his power in the Old Testament. The New Testament, God still has the same power. Shortly after the day of Pentecost, Peter It, uh, in that chapter 3, 1 through 5, it says, Now Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer and at the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms for those who entered the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave him his attention, expecting to receive something from him. John is doing exactly what we were going to (laughs) do. I don't see him, 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 I don't see him. He's not there. He's not there. Let's let's just go on. And Peter's just... Peter, say it with me, church. Peter is a weenie. Thank you very much. John's like, you got to be kidding me, Peter. Why, why are we stopping for this guy? <laughs> Peter took the statement, took what God had given him, and he's running with it. He's bold right now. And so, Peter, really feeling bold in Acts chapter 3 and 6, says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Bold statement in the moment, Peter. This guy hasn't walked a day in his life. And from the nurses in the building, what, what does the body do if it doesn't use a muscle for multiple years? It breaks down. It's not really, he's really boned down there at this point. He, he doesn't really have a lot there to walk with. I could just see the look on John's face just going, Peter, we just, we just got out of church. I know you're feeling ultra spiritual and all, but we're about to go back into church. And, well, why are we doing this now? Peter must have beat him in a race on the second try. So that's my guess. But it's a bold statement coming from Peter. Who uh, couldn't walk on water because he lost his faith. Standing right up. But in Acts chapter 3 and 8, as I'm almost done, so he leaped up, stood, and walked, and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. 
Then they knew that he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement what happened to him. What happens in the Bible is not dated material. That same power that was in Acts chapter 3 is the same power that's here on July 28, 2024. And from whatever days come past this, till the Lord comes, the same power that's in Acts chapter 3 is in this same building and in the same world. The power is not just subject to a building. It's not just subject to a person. It's subject to God. And stuff's going to happen in this building that we won't ever be able to explain. We've already had stuff happen in this building that we will never even explain. But it's just the beginning. As we rise, my last, coming back to our scripture. In Acts chapter 1, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit came into this place a couple weeks ago. That same Spirit's here in this building today. If you want to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, it can happen today. If you want to be baptized, we can fill up the baptistry and we can have that happen today. God's not done with the church. It is just beginning. Faster. Amen. I believe in the power of God, don't you? Amen. I love that, that verse he was talking about. He said, he said they, the magicians, they could make their rods turn into snakes. They could turn the water into blood. They could turn, they could bring the, I mean, think about it. If the, if the land is covered with frogs, I don't like frogs, right? Keep them where they're at. And then the, the, the magicians in Egypt go, yeah, we could bring out even more frogs. How about we don't? All right, let's not do that. So the next plague that comes, and God does a work, and they say, this is the finger of God. They knew what they were doing all before was tricks, right? Nobody, if you ever go watch a magician and you go, ooh and ah, right? The magician knows it's a trick. He's not wowed because he knows the trick. But when they go, I don't know how he did that. This is, this is something that's beyond us. This is God. There are people who are going to come into contact with you, whether it's in the church, in your home, or whatever it is. And they're tired of religion. And they're tired of the same thing. And they're going to feel what you have. And they're going to wait a minute, this is God. This is different. This is different than anything I've ever experienced. And that's what we want. Amen? We want to see God do a great work. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word and for your spirit. God, I pray right now that you would put us in the path of people who are hungry and thirsty for a move of the Holy Ghost, that you would move in this house, oh God, and let people see that this is indeed the hand of God moving in our lives. We thank you and give you praise and glory this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. This Saturday we're going to uh, have prayer and then we're going to put together the kitchen. Uh, please be here for that. I love every one of you and ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you. I'll see you next week.